Uh, so, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our ASIC seminar uh, series. Um, today, uh, it's our great pleasure to have Professor um, Nick uh, Schmer with us. Um, so, uh, Nick is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Geology and here at the University of Maryland. Um, and his research involves um, uh, discipling the formation dynamics and evolution of planetary uh, surfaces and interiors using the tool of uh, geophysics. Uh, this includes research confused ice sheets and volcanoes. Uh, so Dr. Schimmer is um, a partitioning scientist on NASA's InSight mission to Mars and the lead PI of the next come um, Dr. Schimmer. Right. It's like we're, we're, we're getting technical difficulties worked out here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, are we good with the, the WebEx? All right, awesome, thank you. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a little bit of the research that I've been doing um, an Earth's cryosphere, and, and the idea behind it is basically we can use this global climate change signal that's causing all this meltwater that's forming in the, the, um, the ice caps of Earth as a way for us to start to understand some of the structures that might be in the ice shells of these icy ocean worlds that live in the outer solar system of our, 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 our part of the neck, so neck of the galaxy. And so, before I get started, I want to acknowledge that this is not a project that I have been working on alone. There is a huge team of people who have been involved in this research. Um, some of them are sitting in this room. Um, and it comes from a, a huge interdisciplinary effort. So, you know, this is probably within the, the scope of ESSIC, if you like. Um, a lot of these folks here at Maryland, um, both students and past students who have worked with me on these projects, um, folks over at Goddard who have been involved in things. So I know that you all here work with people across these different areas. And then a whole bunch of folks from different institutions around the world. So this is truly um, an interdisciplinary and, and an international collaboration um, working on these kinds of projects. So I want to put that out there and let people know that this is something that isn't just my work alone. Okay, so basically the thing that I'm going to be talking about today is this thing liquid water. So this is one of the reasons why um, we're really interested in this particular substance in the solar system is this is a key ingredient for life. We think that the presence of liquid water on Earth was basically what helped get life started here, um, why we continue to have life. And then the question then becomes, where might this liquid water be elsewhere in the solar system? So NASA has been pursuing this question um, very vigorously over the past um, several decades to try and identify environments where where life could take hold. So understanding the uh, environments in which you can find that liquid water is really very important. So the places where you could find liquid water now, I mean, the, the big duh question to that is, of course, Earth. We have our own planet as a liquid water. We could call it an icy ocean planet if we like. Um, we also have Mars, where there's evidence for um, at least liquid water being there in the past. Now it's mostly frozen or in the deep subsurface. Um, and then we have a whole variety of other players out there that have um, basically a lot of liquid water or probably further down in their atmospheres where there's a lot of water present. Um, so these icy um, giant planets, gas giants that sit out there. And then we also have this whole cadre, whoops, that's, that's a little bit too fast. All right, this whole cadre of what we call icy ocean worlds. Now these are usually moons orbiting some of the ice or gas giants in the outer solar system. And there's good evidence that many of these, these small moons, which are about the size of Earth's moon or smaller, um, could potentially host um, liquid water in, the, in various environments, either in the interior or even close to their surface. And so um, the most prominent of these in more recent times is, of course, this, this moon of Jupiter called Europa, which is an icy ocean planet, has um, a big ice shell and an ocean that sits underneath of it. Here's a picture of it from the Galileo spacecraft showing you in orbit around Jupiter. Um, the interesting thing about Europa is that it is um, a planet, or you could call it a moon. We kind of interchangeably use planet and moon sometimes, even though there's these different classifications in astronomy. I'll make the mistake a couple of times during the talk, I'm sure, but uh, it's an, an ocean world. 
Um, it sits in orbit around Jupiter. It's not the closest moon to Jupiter. It's the second one out. Um, it's probably about 485 um, million miles away or um, 780 million kilometers away. It's quite far away from Earth. Um, uh, this object is tidally locked with Jupiter. Um, so it's basically always facing the same side of Jupiter. Um, it's a little bit smaller than Earth's moon, uh, a radius of about 90% of our, our, our moon's um, size. Um, and it weighs only about a little bit less than 1% of the total mass of the Earth. So this is a relatively small object. Um, the mean density is around three grams per centimeter cubed. So if you're thinking about the density of different materials, that means it's a mixture of probably ice and rock. Um, and it has a surface temperature of about minus, well, 50 to 125 Kelvin. So it's super cold there. Basically, you wouldn't expect liquid water to be present at the surface. But if we go look at the surface of this, this moon, one of the things we notice is it has a very geologically young um, surface feature. So it looks like the, the, the surface, at least the crust, um, the ice crust of the moon, is somewhere on the order of 50 million years old or less, which is kind of a surprising thing. You wouldn't expect this for, if we look at Earth's moon, the surface, um, the crust looks like it's something like four and a half billion years old, and it's been subsequently modified by lots of cratering. Um, we don't really see that at Europa. Um, there's this layer of ice that surrounds the, the surface of the moon. It's somewhere around two to 30 kilometers thick. There's, this is a, a debated um, parameter. People argue about how maybe thick this would be. And we've used various variety of geophysical techniques to identify that there is a liquid water ocean on the order of about 100 kilometers thick beneath this ice shell. Um, sitting beneath that even more unconstrained is perhaps a rocky mantle and an iron sulfide core. So this is kind of an unusual place. Um, here's just a sort of cutaway showing you what the internal structure looks like. So you have this shell of ice and then um, a liquid water ocean and then this sort of rocky um, interior beneath, all right? So if you look at the actual volume of this ocean, so and then calculate the, um, the total amount of water that would sit on Europa, and then basically um, turn it into a little sphere, it's actually on the order of three times the size of Earth's liquid water hydrosphere, which is really interesting. I mean, this is a place that is truly a, a, an ocean world in a sense, where the vast majority of the surface is all ocean. So this is um, sort of the premise for why this is a really interesting object for, um, for study, is that you know, Earth's oceans are host to a huge amount of our biosphere. Um, a lot of the organic activity that takes place on our planet is taking place within the oceans. So Europa, having this large ocean, might be a potential host or habitat for that kind of life. We don't really know the answer to that. So looking in at the surface, looking in at the ice shell, we see all kinds of evidence for recent activity in that ice shell. This is the, basically the geological um, pieces of evidence that point towards this being a relatively young surface. You see all these fractures and cracks, which are related to some of the tidal energy that's being deposited by um, Jupiter into the moon. You see places that look um, vaguely similar to the breakup of some of the ice shelves that we have, for example, down in Antarctica. And then these um, features that are essentially cryovolcanic eruptions or disruptions of the surface where you have what looks like new materials being placed onto the surface. So on, on Europa, since it's so cold, basically you can treat water like a magma when you would in the Earth and it erupts onto the surface explosively and it might make flows, that kind of thing. So you get these um, features that are really um, indicative of, of change in recent times. So how does this all work? Europa is very cold. It's far away from the sun. There isn't this sort of large influx of solar energy that drives a lot of the, the, the liquid water presence here we have here on Earth. Well, Europa has another source of heat, and this is essentially tidal stretching due to its orbit around Jupiter. So you're, you're dissipating tidal energy from the, um, from the orbit into the actual interior of the ice shell, and you also have some non-synchronous rotation within that ice shell, which is creating friction, which can actually start to deposit fairly large amounts of heat. So this 85-hour period it takes 85 hours for Europa to orbit Jupiter. It has a resonance with the other moons that are, are also orbiting Jupiter, which is basically taking tidal energy out of that system and then putting it into the interior. So you get heat flows on the order of about 10 to 100 milliwatts per meter squared. This is very similar to the kind of heat flow that we get in active areas on the surface of the Earth from, um, in, from plate tectonic kinds of processes. And so the idea is that perhaps this is generating solid state convection within the ice shell, so that the shell is actually overturning through time, which tends to erase things like impact craters and create this very young surface. Okay, so 
The other interesting thing about Europa is that there's some evidence that this, this activity might not even be um, geologically young. It might be as recent as the present. We've seen evidence for what look like plumes. This is from the, um, the Hubble Space Telescope, seeing basically these plumes of potentially water coming off of the southern hemisphere of Europa. We've seen similar kinds of phenomenon at Enceladus, which is a moon around Saturn, um, which is perhaps evidence that there's some communication of that ocean with the surface, which is really exciting from a, a science perspective, because here's a chance for us to maybe go there with a mission and sample what's actually happening within the, the ocean beneath. So trying to understand um, if there's been ever been biology in that ocean, or if there's some signature that we can use to tell us more about that composition of the ocean. Um, there's several new missions that are on the books right now. Um, uh, the Europa Clipper is the one that's most um, far along in development. This is basically going to be not necessarily an orbiter that orbits around Europa. It will orbit Jupiter, but it'll dip down and basically take the highest resolution imagery we've ever had of the surface of this moon and basically give us um, a context for perhaps a future lander that could then go to the surface and make different kinds of measurements about what's going on in the ice shell and, and give us information about that interior. Um, one of the big questions is, is how active is that ocean and how active is that ice shell? And by putting some instruments down on the surface like a seismometer, which can measure the seismicity of the world, it should tell us something about the kinds of processes that are taking place in the interior. Okay, so this is basically the crux of my talk, is thinking about how we can actually go at um, this kind of information using seismic waves. And so basically the, um, the, the ground motion that you record from a seismometer, these are very sensitive instruments. Um, they can pick up a, a footstep, you know, half a kilometer away easily. Um, we can see seis um, seismic activity on the other side of our own planet, which is much, much bigger than Europa. So this kind of instrumentation will give us a clue as to what's going on in that ice shell and be able to, to see what kinds of signals might be, be generated by that. So we could basically record if there's tectonic activity, if there's impacts, um, if there's any kind of um, active plume system or other kinds of features that would create noise, if you will, that we could actually pick up with these instruments. We should be able to do that by landing an instrument onto the surface. Okay, and so here's just an example of what we can do right now with um, theoretical models is we can take our knowledge of the physics of, of wave propagation and basically make predictions for how, you know, features within the ice shell might be something that we could pick up with a seismometer and try to better understand that, that feature. So there's a lot of different kinds of science that we can do with um, seismology and we can actually make predictions for that. And that's kind of the stage we're at right now. We don't actually have any data from the, the surface of this, this moon. And so what we can do with those data, I'm not going to get into the details of all these analyses, but we can start to determine things here. This is an example of a kind of seismic analysis called a Vespagram that lets us look at the, the, the arrivals of the various body waves that travel through the ice shell and also look at reverberations within that ice shell and separate them in time. What we call slowness space is basically the, um, the angle at which the wave arrives in and then differentiate those from reflections from the ocean base. So we can directly sound, you know, sort of the primary structural constraints of you know, how thick the ice shell is, how big that ocean is, that's some of the properties of that ocean. So this is a powerful tool for actually getting at some of this information. And so um, we can also go to the, the model space, and this is a, from a recent paper with Terry Herford over at Goddard, where we basically tried to use the dissipation of seismic energy or tidal energy into Europa to model the kind of seismicity that would come out of that. So since Europa has this sort of resonance, there's places that will be activated um, during the tidal cycle that will have um, a larger chance of producing some kind of um, strike slip fall on one of the, the surface features. So this is just showing you the, the orientation of that strike slip fault as it relates to essentially the, the, the tidal orbital period in which you would expect to be activating that. So the seismicity might migrate around and we could use that then if we had an instrument on the surface to actually study um, the internal structure by watching that seismicity move around, we could actually do source location and that kind of thing, similar to what the InSight mission is doing on Mars right now where we're using multiple seismic events in a single station to actually get structural constraints on the interior of Mars. So on this slide, we'll see if this works. I guess I'm unmuted, right? Um, there is a simulation that we've done of essentially what the, the seismicity of Europa would sound like if we assume sort of this random distribution of events over the surface and then shifted it up so that it would be in the audible range of your hearing so you can actually listen to a Europa quake. And so I'll try to keep myself from creating a feedback loop here so you listen to different things, but. Thank <laughs> you. 
so the, the, the question then becomes, what can we do in the, the, the seismology community and the planetary science community to prepare for something like a Europa lander? Um, so one of the things that we can predict is basically how many seismic events we might be able to see in a short duration minute, um, mission where the, the surface radiation on Europa is very quite high, so we don't have the ability to, to survive there for very long, so we need to know, okay, how much data are we actually gonna record? Um, how sensitive does that instrument need to be? Um, Earth's moon is probably the quietest place in the solar system next to being in outer space, as far as we know seismically. Um, is Europa, Europa gonna be like the moon, where we need to have a really super sensitive instrument? Or is it gonna be so noisy because of all of this tidally active seismicity, can we send like a more standard terrestrial instrument or some pretty noisy place? Um, the other question is where should we actually put that instrument? Do we wanna put it near an area where we think it's gonna be seismically active or do we wanna put it away from that so we can look at waves that travel deeper into the interior? Um, and then how can we basically prepare that equipment to? and what kind of signals would we expect to see so that we can then reduce the size of the data that we need to send back. Maybe we don't have to record every minute of noise that we get from Europa. Maybe we want to record only the biggest signals that come out of that. And so this is all sort of practical stuff in actually operating a mission that we can prepare for before we actually fly by doing some of these kinds of studies and using Earth as an analog to do that. All right. So basically if we want to do this kind of study on Earth and then translate that to Europa, we have to think about what kinds of things would go into that kind of seismic study. So we're looking for places on Earth that have thick ice overlying liquid water, um, perhaps even rock, to capture some of the physics of that wave propagation that you might expect on Europa. We're never gonna get a, a thousand or hundred meter thick, well, hundred kilometer thick um, ocean on Earth, obviously, but we can do scaling um, of things to try and match some of the, those scenarios. Um, we'd like to have sources of seismicity that are in ice, so looking for ice quakes, places where you're generating fracture of ice rather than rock, and um, perhaps where we have interaction between ice and water so that we can see what the seismic signals of those kinds of sources would look like. Um, we also are interested in where we might have a tidally modulated system, so we have some sort of tidal signal that we have to pull out of the seismicity. Um, this is something that's almost impossible to do on Earth, but at least trying to couple or isolate ourselves from the atmosphere of our planet, because Europa is obviously not a, doesn't have an atmosphere. So we would expect a very different noise environment there. So thinking about what that means. Um, and then of course, putting together a, a, an appropriate model for our lander that would actually go there so that we don't have noise from the lander itself. And then thinking about the kinds of instruments that would, would be able to fly and preparing those so that they could actually go on one of these missions. So, what I'm gonna go through for the majority of the rest of the talk then are several, two different seismic analogs that we can um, use for Europa. Now, the first of these is actually a, a study of, of a fern aquifer system um, in southeastern Greenland, which in, indeed we can use as a sort of subsurface presence of water, but it's actually kind of an interesting topic onto its own right. So I'm gonna kind of focus in on the terrestrial science from that and sort of bring it back to Europa at the end. And then the second study is basically this, um, a uh, focused analog study up in northwestern Greenland, Greenland looking at a subsurface glacial lake, um, basically something that has thick ice over liquid water that lets us then use this as an analog for a Europa-like environment. Okay, so this is obviously our, our, our little bit of the cryosphere that's um, nearby. Um, so I, I'm sure I'm kind of reiterating something that everybody here knows, but since we have folks that may or may not have this background, um, Greenland, which was in the news recently for some very bizarre reasons, um, is an autonomous country within the kingdom to Denmark. They're, they're their own people. Um, the native people are the Inuit, and they've been there since about the 13th century. There's some debate if the Vikings beat them there. Um, um, it's the largest island on Earth with a population of about 56,000 people. So it's a pretty sparsely inhabited place. Um, it's host to the, the second largest ice sheet on Earth. Um, the ice cap itself is speculated to be around 18 million years old, which formed about the middle Miocene epoch. Um, and what's interesting about Greenland, it's also one of the, the it's hosted some of the oldest rocks on Earth. So that's some of the oldest rocks on the, on the order of 3.8 billion years old. And the average temperature is around minus 20 degrees C at the center. So it's actually a fairly cold place. Um, ice is very stable. Um, the, the more recent events in Greenland, which is more primarily focused around the effects of of melt, um, there's something on the order of around 200 cubic kilometers. I'm getting ahead of myself here. 
that's on the uh, somewhere on the order of 200 cubic kilometers of, of meltwater coming off of this per year. Um, and there's evidence for acceleration of this melt. We see superglacial lakes forming on the surface of the ice. Um, I'll talk a little bit about fern aquifers. We also see subglacial lakes. And so all this meltwater is basically obviously draining into the ocean basins and, and creating um, sea level rise. And so if you were to take the Greenland um, water accumulate or melt rate and then talk about how much green, Greenland is contributing to that um, sea level rise, it's something on the order of 25%, all right? And it sort of varies from year to year, but it seems like this contribution is going up. So there's lots of liquid water around that we can take advantage of, okay? And so here's some just some, some nice snapshots from my field excursions there. You can see this is looking down Helheim Glacier. You can see the, the, the ice melting into this fjord. This is from Kulasuk, Greenland, where you can see some of the icebergs coming out of these deglaciated fjords. Um, and then all kinds of evidence for additional melt taking place, um, retreat of glaciers, um, loss of, of, of ice mass into the surrounding um, ocean. And so the, the two field sites I'm going to focus on, the first one here is down in the southeastern quadrant. Um, this is up near um, Helheim Glacier um, and was funded through an NSF grant with the University of Utah. So like I said, this is a multidisciplinary, multi-collaborative effort. Um, we did active source seismic experiments amongst sort of the kitchen sink of all these other interrogations of this kind of structure. Um, and we're basically looking at a fern aquifer that sits about 20 meters into the subsurface of the, of the ice sheet at that location. Our other field site that I'm going to talk about is um, about 80 kilometers north of Thule Air Force Base. I don't know how many people in this room have actually been up there. Um, but um, this is a NASA-funded project, which is with the University of Arizona. Um, and we're doing both active and passive seismic source experiments. They're trying to use this subglacial lake, which is about um, just a little under a kilometer beneath the surface, um, and use that as an analog environment for studying in Europa. Um, so we took out a candidate flight instrument to this location and then basically a, a mock-up um, lander that we put these instruments up on top of to see how the effects of that lander would um, affect those sites. And so I like to, to give a little overview of how we actually get there because one of the interesting things about field work is actually the process of getting into the field itself. Um, so we were flying from Washington, D.C. Um, to, in this particular case, to um, Reykjavik in Iceland and then back to Kulsuk, Greenland to, to, to get to our field site then by helicopter. Um, Kulasuk, I don't know how many folks in here have been there. I know one person has been there, um, Lynn Montgomery, who was in the field with us, who's in the audience. Um, this is the luxurious, um, possibly three-star hotel Kulasuk, um, which is, was our sort of our home base when we were, we were there in um, Kulasuk. Um, here's the little village of Kulasuk nestled, nestled right up along the shore of the, the, the Fjord Straits. And it's really quite a scenic area. I have to highly recommend a visit there if you get a chance to go. Um, to get up onto the ice sheet, we used um, uh, helicopters and then sling loads. Here's a sling load actually being prepared to go off of the ice sheet. But we had to basically take up all of our gear, um, all of our equipment, and put it up onto the ice sheet using these sling load approaches. This is the field team. I'm not going to go through all the Motley crew that was out there with us, except to point out the lens here in the audience. Here and this is this is me looking a little warm because it was definitely not that cold. We didn't need the Arctic gear there. It's about zero degrees C at this site. We were out there two times, um, once in 2015, summer of 2015, and the summer of 2016 as well. Um, the living conditions were quite luxurious. We had these beautiful Arctic oven tents that were nice and toasty during the day and kept us warm at night. <clears throat> the surface conditions were usually pretty um pretty flat and easy to deal with. We'd have a, a bit of a mushy surface during the day when we would get um, melt from the, 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 the sun basically um, heating up the surface, and at night it would refreeze. <clears throat> and um, what we were investigating was this, this fern aquifer. So this is a cartoon basically showing a cross-section through the ice sheet. So you have the bedrock down here. Here's the glacial ice itself. And the fern aquifer occurs in this accumulation zone and, and sort of down into the ablation zone where you have um, meltwater from the surface percolating down through the porosity of the fern. Here's a bit of fern sort of zoomed in. And then accumulating at the um, permeability change where you go to the glacial ice and essentially starting to flow downhill. And so our team's goal was to basically understand some of the hydrology of the system, how much water is present in these aquifers, 
Um, <clears throat> we can see the tops of the aquifers by basically um, um, putting ice penetrating radar through the ice sheet. And this, in fact, this is how they were first identified until people went out and drilled and verified their existence. But essentially, you have um, radar detections of, of basically near surface water showing up um, around 2010 and then expanding as we move um, and explored other places around Greenland at the ice sheet margin. So these are relatively new feature that has appeared within the last decade or so of the ice sheet, um, and it seems to be growing in, in extent. Okay, so the, the field site what we're looking at um, for this fern aquifer, here's Helheim Glacier, um, and then there's been several radar traverses here, all this sort of squiggly lines here are basically showing um, the overflights by aircraft to where the reflections of this water have been detected in the near surface. And then you can map out in color here the depth to the essentially the aquifer layer that's down beneath. Um, it seems like this is because of we have this sort of increase in melt um, in the surface. It's percolating downward. Um, <clears throat> and where we see the, the highest water table, it typically is associated with where we have large slopes in the, in the, um, the, the ice sheet. So this is basically finding its way down slope. All right, and so um, if you look at this in, in cross section now, we can basically map out. Here's the surface reflection from the ice sheet. This is corrected for topography. Here's the topo topographic profile of this um, the surface, and then the red is the slope of the surface. You can kind of see where the surface slope is higher, um, and then this right here is that reflection from the, the the aquifer itself. So it mirrors essentially the the surface topography, um, and we're able to actually detect it by um, looking at either ground-based or, or overflight types of radar. Okay, so the, this is how it was initially identified. Um, the reason why we went out to the field was to better understand, okay, not just where the aquifer is, but also some of the, the dynamics associated with it. So we did a whole suite of different techniques. We took ice cores. Um, we did several different kinds of geophysical experiments to, to query the, basically the amount of water, the thickness of the, the aquifer itself, how much water was present. Um, and then a whole suite of hydrological experiments to actually measure the conductive conductivity, the permeability of the fern itself to see how this um, water is moving through that system. And then monitoring to basically, um, both through a weather station installed at the, the various sites that we visited, and also um, instruments that we put down into the aquifer itself to monitor temperature and pressure changes that are associated with the, 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 the addition or loss of water. And so, this little zoom in here of our field site was actually spread out along about a 10, 15 kilometer long line. Here's a world view image of our campsites. You can see several tents here where we were, where we were living and a gear line and some random place over here that we would all go visit every day. Um, here's an example of some of the, the work that we were doing there. So, so interrogating the near surface fern and snow pits. Um, basically installing monitoring systems down core holes, which we collected with this, this system that let us basically melt the, the, the surrounding material and pull up a core, which is, here's an example of one of the cores that we were collecting here. We also were able to pump liquid water out of the aquifer itself and have a drink. Um, <clears throat> and here's a great picture of Lynn and Olivia um, sitting in one of our Arctic oven tents pumping water out of the aquifer and taking samples, and it was kind of a miserable experience because you're pumping zero degree C water onto yourself, basically trying to get it into this tube. Um, Lynn can tell you all about that. Um, and then, of course, we have this suite of different geophysical techniques. Um, here's me doing an improvised seismic shot with a shovel. They forgot to send the hammer, and they sent it on a later flight. Um, and then Anatoly, one of our um, other geophysicists, doing some magnetic resonance sounding. Okay, so uh, since I'm a seismologist, I like to talk about seismology. I want to show you sort of the ingredients that go into an active source seismic experiment. I don't know how many of you here have experience with that. Um, but basically, the idea is you take a hammer, um, you hit a metal plate, you have a line of geophones. This is a, the, the geophones kind of going out in a line here um, next to our, one of our weather stations, and then basically record the seismic energy from, the, from the, the hammer strike. So this is all the recording system here, and Lynn actually manning the, um, the computer. And so what you get, depending upon where your um, shot is along the line, you'll get these waves that spread out into the subsurface, which are essentially bending through the different layers, and they tell you about the velocity of the subsurface. I love this figure because it shows the, um, the, the appropriate sort of hierarchy that sits in the field. We have the postdoc doing all the work, <laughs> professor oversighting the undergrad, helping out with data re recording and, and management. So Clem did a lot of shots. I, I did more than he did. Credit. 
<laughs> so we take these data. Um, so here's a, this is actually the data from one of the particular locations. You can see the, the P waves bending through the subsurface. We can see surface waves and, um, and S waves bending through the subsurface as well, including the sound of the hammer traveling a lot at the speed of, of sound to the atmosphere. And we also have a reflection from the, the, the deepest part of the ice sheet. We see a reflection from that ice rock interface beneath us. And we can use a, a transdimensional Bayesian approach to essentially try and fit the, the bend of the waves through the subsurface to find the, the change in velocity with depth. Which then, if we do this in a Bayesian approach, we try a whole bunch of different models to see what fits and create a model space, and basically allows us to sort of find the, the, the suite of models that best describe the data that we find in the subsurface. And the, the nice thing about this approach is it also gives you information about um, where things might have dis strong discontinuities in depth. We don't prescribe the geometry of the, the layers themselves. We let the, the Bayesian approach basically sort that out for us. So we can figure out where there might be a transition with the, the aquifer base to um, from water saturated fern to essentially um, um, ice itself. And so that gives us a map of essentially the probabilities of, of any given seismic velocity. So this is P wave seismic velocity as a function of depth. And then the coloring here is telling you essentially how often that particular velocity occurred at that particular depth in our Bayesian approach to the models. And so you can take that and then create a statistical basically variation of velocity and depth and start to then map out that kind of structure. So it's, a, it's kind of an elegant way to, to constrain what's going on and takes the uncertainties of the problem into account. Um, so if we do this for a variety of uh, different sites, kind of moving down slope from the, the highest elevation to the places at lowest elevation, um, and then compare some of our results, so these are the seismic results, to the stratigraphy that was obtained from the core. So the different stratigraphies here, we have ice lenses, clear ice, and then fern, which is actually in white, um, where the GPR detected the water table. So we have this GPR system out there with us. Um, we can also map out where the, we map the seismic transition to the, the ices, and then um, take the density from cores that were sampled in the same location. So we can actually look at all these parameters together. And what we see is fairly good agreement um, between um, at least where the, the ice transition is at the base of the aquifer and where we see these lenses of of clear ice start to come in. There's a little bit of complexity that takes place um, in the, the site that's at the bottom of the hill where there's apparently been a lot of sort of freezing and un, um, reintroduction of new aquifer systems down there. Um, that maybe the oldest aquifer systems are, are located there, so we see more of this clear ice. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do with this data. In fact, we're still working with these data to try and um, better understand some of the relationships between these, these properties. Um, well, one of the things we can do is now that we have a thickness of the aquifer, um, we can actually use the, the seismic waves to do some um, estimates of the actual quantity of water, the thickness of the layer itself, and then the abundance of water that sits in the pore space. Um, and so in our analysis, we come up with about 16 plus or minus 8 percent um, porosity in, the, in the, the aquifer layer itself. So you can have a minimum of around 8 percent porosity up to almost 25 percent porosity. Um, so that tells you that the aquifer has sort of these different storage capacities and it depends on the local ice structure. Um, we see a systematic increase in the amount of water that's in that aquifer as we move down slope, which probably is a sort of makes sense. Um, and there seems to be evidence for where there's higher flow where you hit a topographic gradient, i.e. we see a change in the amount of water places where you have steep slopes so that water isn't staying in the aquifer for very long. Um, we did notice that there's an upward expansion from upward meaning going uphill, the, the aquifer seemed to move a few kilometers further uphill than it was in the previous field season. So we're actually in a site that we saw was dry in the previous year, um, had water in it basically the following year. Um, so if we take those water estimates and turn them into a total sort of storage of water in the Helheim aquifer alone, we come up with about four and a half gigatons of liquid water. Remember that you know Greenland's losing about um, on the order of um, 20 to 20 times to 40 times that. So these are actually not the hugest contributor, but they're also, con this is just one aquifer system. Remember, they're spread out across the surface of Greenland. So this is actually probably not an insignificant contributor to sea level rise if that water is being communicated into the oceans. Okay, sorry, I went through that a little fast. So sort of the story that we came up with um, about the aquifers themselves to try and make this consistent geophysical mapping uh, is that we notice that as you go downhill, you're getting more water into that system, but we also notice that there is this sort of increase in the number of ice lenses that are present um, in the, the sub 
aquifer layers. So we think what's happening is you have compaction, cumulative compaction of that surface material, and then basically you're pushing old aquifer down to greater depths. And when you do that, it goes through an isotherm where you're transitioning from zero degree C water in the aquifer system to basically zero degree C ice. So you're releasing that latent heat um, and essentially freezing out these old paleo aquifers, if you will, beneath. Um, paleo means sort of relative here. And so we would expect that as you move down slope, you're essentially going to freeze out more aquifer, but you're going to be adding liquid to the top of that. So you're essentially creating an impermeable boundary at the base of the aquifer system, which essentially is, is funneling water down the ice sheet. So you get melt produced uphill, and it's just coming down slope with the aquifer system. What the ultimate fate of that water is is still sort of up in the air. Um, this whole se section of aquifer is intersected by crevasses down slope. So presumably when you hit the crevasse field, that water is going to then start to drain into those crevasses, and you're going to basically empty the aquifer into a crevasse system, and then the fate of it depends upon what's going on inside those crevasse systems themselves. Okay. So while we were out there working on top of this area, um, I set out what I call a little test array to thinking about sort of back to Europa and the kind of science that we could do there. I set out a seismic array sort of on the scale of a little lander, so a few meters wide, where we could actually then go around that and put a bunch of um, seismic sources and try and locate those with this array. So how could we use like a little seismic system put out on the land, the legs of a lander on the surface of Europa to then, then go about locating seismicity? And so you can, as you can imagine, you can look at different sizes of that array. And so we did a study to basically see how well you could locate these, these events and basically come up with you need to have sort of a source um, or at least a separation of the instruments on the order of, of a few meters to actually do this kind of location, at least at high frequency. So here's an example where we can go out to these kinds of environments. And if you're thinking about the planetary problem, you can come up with something that you can do in a couple of hours that then you can turn into really useful data for, for planetary science and thinking about how we can use these environments. Okay, and so basically the, the idea here would be that when we're on the surface of Europa, we're only going to have maybe a lander, and we're not going to have multiple landers, so you have to actually be able to do source location with a single seismic station. And if we can add these additional components to the lander, meaning that we put more than one instrument on the lander itself, how can we use that to improve the kind of science that we would do at Europa? All right, and so there's several different kinds of, of seismic approaches that let us essentially map out um, the, the location of seismicity by looking at the back azimuth. So we can project back with these small number of stations where the energy is coming from, and then use the, the separation of P and S to then look at the distance. So if you know azimuth and distance, you're able to do some sort of source location. Okay, So that'll be really important when we finally get to Europa with uh, instruments on the surface. Okay, let me see where I am in time, because I always, what is our sort of schedule? Is it? 12, 1 o'clock, or so we, 120? Okay, I'm just checking because I think we started a little late and I want to make sure I had enough time to go through this. All right. So let me start in on our second field site. This is um, basically looking at the ice sheet north of Canuck, Greenland. Um, basically, this one is a little bit more involved to get to. We weren't able to take commercial flights to get there, so we had to use the Air National Guard. NSF provided us with support. So we flew from Schenectady, New York, all the way up to Kangarlooswak, where we caught another flight up to Thule Air Force Base, and basically that was where all of our gear was sent, and we worked out of there. Um, and then uh, Air Greenland provided air support that got us actually out into the field, so they, they carried all of our gear up onto the field. And then the luxurious part about Thule Air Force Base is that returning back, we were able to catch basically a military flight back to Baltimore. So for me, I was just like, hey, I'm back home, and just... After 10 hours of sitting on a plane, everybody else had to go catch connections, but pretty luxurious way of coming back, right? Direct flight from Thule to Baltimore. Okay, so like I said before, I like to show some of the sort of the details of getting there because this is always very interesting. Here is all of our gear, <laughs> and we're on the, we're including us, so they, they literally shipped all of us and our gear on the same flight. Um, here's a C-130 up in, in Goose Bay. We've made a stop there for ice cream and fuel. Um, and then you get to Kanger, and basically you're, you're, you're gearing up all of your, your equipment. So they have a, um, support services there, polar, service, polar um, support services that basically give us access to all the equipment we need for being in the field. Um, and then, of course, we are going into a place that is um, relatively close to the coast. So we had to actually go through polar bear safety training. Um, here's our, our polar bear safety 
um, equipment. Hopefully never had to use that, thank goodness. Um, and we're based out of the, the Kanger Lusak International Science Supporter, the KISS. Um, once we get up to Thule, Thule kind of looks like McMurdo to my eye. It's kind of this desolate place of trailers um, where we organized more gear and did some pre-field testing in a hangar. And then we took our helicopter flight stopping over at the tiniest little airport in Canuck, which didn't even have a working toilet. It was amazing. Um, and then, of course, we get up onto the ice, um, basically with our helo support, um, snowmobiles to get around. Here's one with um, equipment precariously positioned on it. And then the field team, um, which is folks from University of Alaska, people from University of Arizona, they were cold. Um, and then, of course, myself. Um, oops, wrong way. I think I won't, maybe this is going to be very loud. I might turn it down just a little bit. This is just showing one of the dramatic moments of, of putting gear. So the, the Thule was actually considerably colder than, than, than Kula Souk. It's probably about um, average daily temperature of minus 5 to minus 9. So the surface did not, did not thaw in the morning and afternoon. Um, we occasionally had a couple of weather days where you know, a blizzard would blow through and you basically kind of hang out in your tent. Um, we even had some, um, thankfully, avian visitors. These are a couple of birds that were making their way over our field site and then stopped to, to hang out and chatter at us for a little bit. Um, fortunately, no polar bears. Um, living conditions, kind of, same kind of deal. Big house tent where people could hang out and basically make food. Um, yeah, sure. If I were a bear, I'd go for the food tent, not the, not the camping tents. <laughs> um, and the question that we were investigating was basically the subglacial lake. So we're located up here on the surface. And beneath this particular location, um, overflights with radar had basically detected. Um, so here are the radar overflights evidence for essentially um, subglacial lakes. So the, this is the bed elevation in color here, and then the black lines indicate locations where basically the radar would see a nice level surface at the base of the ice sheet, which they inferred to mean that there's a lake there. Actually, on our flight up there, we saw an example of one of these kinds of lakes. Um, if you took all of the ice off of it, this is about the same scale. That's about two kilometers by two kilometers wide. So you have basically these um, basins that are catching um, water and essentially storing it at the base of the ice sheet. Um, so um, if you look at the surface, though, there's really nothing to, to, to indicate the presence of this. It's flat. We're right near the ice divide. And so the question then becomes, what can we do with this kind of environment? All right. And so we set out a whole suite of equipment. We put out seismometers that were going to sit between May um, and August to basically collect passive seismic data. Um, we did some ice-penetrating radar to further characterize the small-scale structure of the underlying lakes. And then we also did um, um, some active source seismology to, to better characterize um, what was happening with the, the, the lake itself. Um, and then we left a weather station and a GPS station there to monitor both the flow of the ice and then look at the local climatic conditions that were right near our, our site. We are located basically as close to the middle of this lake as we could get, given our sort of um, imprecise locations of the edges of the lake itself, and basically situated right above it a few um, about 80 kilometers from Canuck, which is just down here on the other side of this little island here. OK. And so here's some pictures of the science that we were doing. So we set out a, a lander mock-up. So here's our little um, aluminum lander mock-up. Yeah, it's not quite as high fidelity as, 
It's what you would expect that we would send to Europa, but it's got all the basic elements. You have a platform in which your equipment's going to sit, and then you have some legs that will couple it with the surface. Um, we went around with a ice penetrating radar system with the GPS for giving us position, um, and then installed seismometers almost directly into the to the ice itself. All right, so equipment basically all over the place looking at these things. Um, the the lander itself was actually we put it inside of this giant box. This was fun digging a big hole here. Um, one of my talents in the field is digging holes, so they were happy to have me. Um, this is basically a three by three by two meter um, big hole. We have this big enclosure that we build around our lander. And the idea behind this is to essentially isolate it from the atmospheric effects of the, the wind blowing and that kind of thing and decouple it from some of that. Okay, so install that in there. Um, we basically install of our equipment in the ground beneath the lander. Um, on the lander, around the lander, basically every kind of size monitor you can think of installed around this thing, seal it up, and then we have all these boxes that sit on the surface that provide um, data logging and um, solar panels to, to collect that data. Um, here's an example of the, the array once it was all installed. Basically everything's buried under the ground with our um, equipment basically recording here up on the surface. We can do test shots with a, um, some active source experiments and then record that data and take a look at it and actually use this to, to, to study um, what we would expect to see from a Europa lander. <clears throat> so um, one of the, the, the experiments that we did was essentially a, a co-joined um, ice penetrating radar and seismic reflection survey, sort of similar to what I showed earlier where we're trying to sound through the ice and the, um, the underlying water so we can determine essentially depth of the lake, how thick the lake was, if there's any underlying sediments, any even structures that might sit in the, the rock underneath. So here's Aaron demonstrating the proper One, technique two, for a seismic three. shot. Let's be straightforward. What? I show this to my students so they know. Okay, there's how you there's how you do it, guys. <laughs> And so the results from that, so I'm going to show you some things that we haven't published yet but are, are going to be out soon, is here's uh, showing the ice penetrating radar. So you can see the, the lake itself. Note this isn't corrected for surface topography. And then as we come up off the lake, you start to see essentially the, um, the local topography and the, the rock around us. And then in the seismics, so this is the seismic reflection profile, you can again see the lake um, and then us coming up off of that and going into the, the local topography. And then you see another one down here. This is the second reflection, basically. So you're getting a reverberation in the ice shell. And we're able to see this um, more or less with a single hammer stroke. So you don't really need to stack a lot of data actually to get through almost a kilometer of ice. Ice is very transmissive in this region, which is that's a really exciting um, result for us to be able to see so nicely through this and actually do the, the, the imaging of this. Uh, and so one of the things you may notice with the IPR is that there is no sort of secondary reflection or anything like that. So the ice, the, the water ice interface is basically reflecting most of that radar energy back and we're not actually seeing into the water. With the seismics though, we're starting to see a bunch of coda behind those primary arrivals, both the, the, the first and the secondary reflections. And that's actually reverberations in the lake itself. So we can actually use the seismic um, methodology to, to give us information about what lies beneath the lake. Um, and so I have a, student who's been working on this um, and basically taking the, the data from the, the seismic and essentially modeling the, the arrivals and trying to figure out where the lake bottom is. And there seems to be a little ambiguity here. We could be seeing some, some um, lake sediments that are actually sitting inside of those materials. So there might be like um, till or other kinds of materials that are creating reverberations in there as well. But we're still working on that. And it's actually a really exciting data set to be to doing work with. Um, we've also done a little bit of work trying to look at the sort of resolution of the data that come from the lander versus on the ground. So one of the ways to do this is to look at the coherence of the seismic waves that arrive on the lander versus the, the waves that arrive at the stations that sit beneath the lander in the, the subsurface. And so during an earthquake, we actually see a relatively high coherence between the lander and the deck and the lander ground, which is actually kind of what we would expect, is the, the lander itself isn't participating in that longer period um, 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 signal. But then when we're looking at just the background noise, you actually see that the lander deck um, is, is way more noisy than the ground. So this is kind of expected. But when you have that signal coming in from the seism seismic event, at least the teleseism, we actually start to get the coherence between the two, which is letting us sort of better understand how we wanna, would want to do this kind of science on Europa. Um, here's just another movie showing you. We've calculated from 
um, a theoretical standpoint what the, the land of resonances would look like. Um, now note this is highly exaggerated, um, so you know, the boogie lander. Um, but basically we can use that to then figure out, okay, where would there be noise in the design? So for the, the theoretical lander that goes to Europa, we should be able to do the same kind of calculation and figure out essentially um, what we would expect to see on the seismic data that would come from that lander. So really the, the, the next steps in this particular project is we're taking that data and we're trying to understand sort of the origin of this lake. Um, if it's a hypersaline lake that's basically been sticking around for a long time, if it's a, um, a meltwater feature from water transporting down to the subsurface somehow. Um, so we can use the seismic waves to try and determine some of that. Um, we're looking at the, the seismicity that we recorded during the experiment to try and understand if, they're, if we're seeing like the, this, the, the ice breakup, for example, as it migrates to the north. We're there just basically across the time where the, the sea ice was breaking up just out in the ocean around us. Um, this would be analogous to like, you know, a migrating fracture system on Europa where um, the tidal seismicity is migrating as you move through that, that, um, that orbit around Jupiter. Um, and then, of course, we're also using the GPS to find some of the, the local ice velocity and dynamics and seeing if the lake has in any localized effect on that, that system, okay? So I would say that the, this, the seismic imaging that we're doing in Greenland is really enabling us to do some new science and thinking about how to better understand Europa and other icy ocean worlds. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so this is just a time lapse of our site. Um, we left a, a weather station and then a camera, so you can basically just watch the field site. And you'll notice that we, ha we had a little snowstorm. So just use this as a reference here. Um, this is our GPS station. That's about, I think, a little over a meter. Um, and you'll be able to see the sun going around, snow coming in more accumulation there. I find this very zen. <laughs> but then we had a couple of precipitation events that um, <laughs> buried our stations. <laughs> so you'll see. Comes up pretty soon. off come on do it there you go <laughs> so it, it, this is very um, illustrative of the kinds of conditions that were there the whole time we were there is that some days it'd be super clear and just a little windy and then it would get sort of stormy and cloudy and, and only last for half a day or so the, the presence of humans is erased pretty quickly um, all of our footsteps and stuff get filled in, and then essentially it goes back to this nice flat surface. So now here's the storm event that basically covers us over. A couple of days, it basically starts to fill up the whole site and, and basically put all of our solar panels underneath about a meter of snow. We were expecting two meters of, of deflation. We got a meter of accumulation. So the demobilization team had a good time digging all that out. Um, especially since we buried everything about two meters down because we're worried about things being exposed at the surface. So two meters is a long ways to dig. So now we're getting buried. All right, I'll end it about there because I think it basically gets covered over here and you can't see anything. All right, so I'll leave it there. Um, any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi there. I had one question from early on in your talk. I was just got curious about it. You're, you were talking about this one future Europa mission, the Clipper, yeah, that is just going is basically still going to be in orbit around, you know, the major planet, not around the moon. Huh? Is that just impractical to try and set up a, a moon orbit, or just that was just a curiosity thing came up in my head? Um, so Europa sits within Jupiter's radiation belts. And so if you were to stay in orbit around Europa, you would basically be sitting in Jupiter's radiation belts, and it would greatly shorten the length of your, your mission. So by dipping into the, the or, you know, where Europa is at the time and, and sort of doing a flyby, um, you minimize the amount of time that you actually spend in those, those 
pretty damaging environments. Um, all your electronics have to be, um, you know, rad, rad hard. Basically, they have to be able to withstand that intense radiation environment. Otherwise, you just fry everything. So if you can mitigate that to some extent, that, that's to your advantage. That's the idea behind the clipper, um, is that you're not going to actually go in orbit around Europa, because if you did, you just, you wouldn't last very long. Um, the lander has this challenge. It's going to actually sit on the surface and, and sit bathed in this radiation environment. Okay.